Hi, John. Hello. I have a double screen now, so I go back and forth looking at the different screens. <laughs> I have four, so I'm like, oh, it's... Oh my goodness, four screens? Yeah, I used to day trade, and so I used to have all my info up. Wow, that's a lot. And now I don't anymore, but I still have the screens. <laughs> <laughs> It's sad, but I have to work on something right now. Uh -huh. um, Where's the background? I just. Transactions, new. Bottom of the thing, new purchase. I'm going to see. And it is Vicky Bayou. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's a great picture. There we go. <laughs> I'm going space today. Let's see. So I called 150 people this weekend. Wow. I cold called, yeah. So that's good. I got four, no, five potential listings. So I have to follow up with folks, but yes. I passed, I passed out my brochures to people along my street yesterday. Nice. Got one person who said she had a real estate agent, but right. they went separate ways amicably, but she was still wanting to buy a certain kind of property. Yeah. Uh, so she gave me all kinds of details, and she is very actively searching. She's sending me all kinds of places. What about this? What about this? What about this? And we just found one that she is in love with, and she wants me to start writing up the paperwork for an offer. Nice. And she's headed down to go see it right now, I hope. Cool. Tonight, yeah. tonight in the competition. <laughs> We're like, this is fast. Turn around. Getting ready to start my class. What are you doing? Yeah, okay. if, her, if her agent's going to sleep on it, why Why should you? Yeah. Like, I'm not going to. Oh, what is she doing? Done and gone, then I'm going to hit it hard. Yeah. Keep her motivated. What am I doing? Oh. Yes. I don't remember it at the time, but I know that you have talked about it. Hi, Leslie. Tina, how did you get started in real estate? Mm -hmm. Well, I was an elementary teacher, but um, hmm. in October, my students traumatized me to the point that I could not return. I've been in counseling ever since. The, not your desk, the filing cabinet and next to it? So oh. now, um, as of January, I started class for real estate because okay. I was like, well, if I can't teach, what am I going to do? So I've always been interested in houses and okay. things like that. So that's where I went. Um, I have a specific I one. To hear a lot of people's stories and is, how it is, is she looking for a specific date? Okay, so she just needs any one for Jared. Okay. All right, Mama. Did you guys? Of course. Did you guys meet with Michelle today? <laughs> I don't want to interrupt her phone call. I know. Leslie, you're not muted. Thank you. There we go. All right. What if I send this picture to my Mac? I'm going to change the background for just a second. I went out to uh, Hillsboro Airport to uh, inquire about a pilot's license. So they gave me the paperwork to sign up. So getting that started. Wow, that sounds fun. It's going to be so much fun. Hey, guys.
So we will do our accountability real quick and then we will intro and welcome Ben, um, our instructor today. So go through and let me know how many contacts you've made today or if you're counting from this weekend, that's totally fine too. And then any other new clients or appointments. Um, Desiree, you wanna get us started? Hello, so I've made about uh, between seven and 10. Some of them were good contacts. Some of them were just handing out cards a bit. Um, I hit a couple garage sales in my neighborhood this weekend and some of the people let me like um, put cards by their little stand and um, made some good community contacts. Um, I got to go on a home inspection today and meet a couple more inspectors. Um, and uh, my first house just got appraised with, it appraised at value with no repairs. So we should be looking forward to closing on that. Um, so yeah, that's, that's about it. Great job. Tina? Oh, you're muted. Okay. There you go. So yesterday I took my brochures and um, started passing them out to more people down my street. And I got one person who said that she has been looking for a place for over a month. She had a realtor, but they decided to go separate ways but she's still interested in looking. And so I've been working with her and like 10 minutes ago, she said, okay, let's write an offer on this one. Nice. So I'm gonna start writing the offer and she's actually gonna go down and look at the property <laughs> before I try to send it. But that way we've got it all quickly ready to go. Perfect, awesome. John? So I cold called about 150 people this weekend. I just went for like <laughs> three hours both days. And I got uh, five potential listings that I have to follow up on. And I got about 10, like 11 or 12 people ready to, uh, uh, looking to buy soon. So I, sent, I started them on a follow up schedule and some neighborhood watch or neighborhood nurturing. There you go. <laughs> Amazing. Great job. Cool. Alan? Yeah, so I've been calling and meeting people and there's a guy I know sort of and he's got some property that he's looking to sell. He's got 10 acres and he's looking to sell five of it. So I'm looking at helping him out and we're going to meet on Thursday about that. Awesome. Great job. Jerry? So over the weekend, I've been reaching out to my sphere of influence, kind of letting them know I'm out there. And I actually have a friend who knows a lady who wants to list her property. So she's going to talk to her first and then give her my information. So I'm just waiting to hear back from her, but it looks, it looks really good. Good. Awesome. Yeah. It's a great day. All right. Jenny, you want to go? No pressure. I know you're not typically on here, but if you want to share, I won't skip you. Hello. Um, I did not do any open houses this weekend. There weren't any to shadow. Um, I did build my website on KW. Um, I do have a couple of buyers from previous open houses that I'm sort of dripping following up on right now. And I helped a neighbor of mine get a refi started two days ago. And I am working on doing a command design postcard campaign right now, direct mail postcard campaign. Great, great job. Those are all awesome things. Lisa? Um, yeah, so I actually have an appointment. I have to leave a little early today. I have an appointment with a, a friend of mine who is looking at selling um, a house she inherited. So we'll talk about that tonight. Awesome. Um, and then I actually have been doing, working on my pot buys. And so I, I had to take my, my old work laptop back today. And so I put a little basket together for the company. And when I was in the parking lot, 
one of my old coworkers came up to me and said that they were really interested in buying. So we have an appointment this Friday to meet up and go over all of that. Awesome. And then um, I also got a text message last night from one of the lenders that I've been working a lot with that she potentially has a referral she's sending my way. So. Great, great job guys. Sherry. Um, yeah, I have a couple, uh, maybe four folks I'm working with at the moment. Um, the most pressing is um, um, I have a buyer that is um, ready to buy. She's already talked to her, the, the financial gal, and um, she's she's really wanting to to buy. She's the thing. What she wants is seems to be out of her price range from what she says she wants to pay for. So I'm, we're kind of trying to meet the middle somewhere. Um, so that's kind of the hard part for me is explaining that that she may not get exactly what she wants for 250 or 275 but she can go to the, but you know I mean that 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 sort of thing that's kind of the hard part for me because she all the things she says she wants but um and then I have a couple other appointments this week but um I'm just trying to see if I can make that one buyer happy because I think she'll I think she's ready to go but she just needs to maybe get a little more realistic have her I, focus on what's super super important and then well, yeah. she can build on and I was explaining that that um, because she she was explaining that you know you know that she's always busy and doesn't have she says what she wants but then doesn't have time and I was like well if you find what you want in that price range it's not going to last so you're going to have to at, you know for very long so I'm just yeah. I think I think we're kind of in kind of in the education um, section at this point. Good, keep it up, Danielle. Hello. Um, so I have a buyer that I've been working with and as you know, we were very close to writing an offer. I thought on, um, Saturday, but, um, his wife ended up nixing it because of the yard, which is fine. There's a house that they're uh, really interested in that is tenanted. So they've been kind of um, hesitant to go look at it because they're worried about the delay, but, um, I think it could be really exactly what they want. So we're going to go look at it Saturday and then I helped them get into some short term housing, which, um, <laughs> sorry, dog. Um, which I think he's pretty excited about because um, he's living in a hotel right now. And that's part of why he was trying to make a rush decision is just because he needed to just get moved. And I don't really think that's a good place to be in when you're buying. So we got him a nice house where they'll be very comfortable out in Springfield um, until they find exactly what they're looking for. So I'm really hoping that Saturday um, he can kind of look at it with a little bit more patient outlook because he'll be in a comfortable space um, and not so worried about getting out now. And yeah. then um, I was reaching out to my sphere and um, one of my girlfriends who I've been wanting to really have a good, sorry, a good sit down with because um, she's in a huge transition place um, in her life. Um, I just reached out to her just as a friend and she said, oh, by the way, my neighbor uh, needs a realtor. So I gave her your info and um, so hopefully she'll be reaching out to me soon. I'm actually going to follow up today and see um, if they've actually exchanged the info yet or not but um so that looks pretty good and yeah, um that's one other thing to stay yeah. in yeah. mind you know, opportunity what was that last thing you said it was one of the top things just um reaching out it's not always them that needs to do business but if you're top of mind then they're constantly thinking about it well and i was telling my husband this weekend uh, one of my favorite things about this new career Today's a little hectic. <laughs> You're lucky I was only two minutes late today. Um, I was telling my husband one of my favorite things about this new career is it's legitimately my job to get back in touch with all these people that I've lost contact with. I've been crazy at home renovating, you know, moving and moving cross country. And we've been so busy the last few years that I do feel like I've kind of lost a little bit of contact. And right now, I'm not even considering it like a real estate conversation it just I'm just reaching out to everybody and it's yeah. a great excuse to like reconnect with your people so I'm not for sure and already twice three times it's turned into 
facilities that are warm, you know, developing. But, yeah. Good job. All right, Corin. Um, yeah, so this uh, last weekend, I actually went camping with the family uh, down in Lake, so I had almost no reception, so I couldn't do much working. Um, and then this morning, my daughter, unfortunately, had to have four teeth pulled, so. Aww. But I was still managed to uh, try and call at least uh, 10 people. I was only able to connect with three of them, but I at least attempted to do that. Um, but uh, uh, luckily, my daughter's healing well and should be hopefully uh, back to normal uh, by the end of today. Um, yeah. With, uh, the numbing wearing off but uh, I also talked with um, a couple that w is looking at buying uh, that I met at uh, open house I did for you uh, a couple of weeks ago Mara yeah but uh, they are not quite ready so <clears throat> just educating them they're first time home buyers newlyweds very green on the process so just just uh, feeding them a little bit of information so I don't overwhelm them but it's also a good is to continue to contact them and, and kind of help them with the process. Um, refer them to a lender I work with uh, or want to work with. Um, so um, hopefully they can answer any questions there. So that's pretty much what I've been doing the last few days. Awesome. Great job. Leslie? Hi. Sorry, I've got so much going on right now. Um, so I've been busy. Um, I've got a couple new buyers interested in some property, so I've been showing a lot. Uh, we finally got our first accepted contract. Yeah, I'm so excited. Um, so on a buyer that we put in several offers, none of them had gotten accepted because she's kind of in that price range where it's just really difficult. But we got one, so we're working on that. And I've got appointments throughout the week set up. And um, yeah, it's just been good, it's been busy. Good, good job. All right, we have Margie. So I've been working with a lady that was gonna offer me the listing once it expired, which will expire in September 10th. I'm also looking for houses for her. And also my husband has a friend that's looking for a house. And I'm trying to get familiar with the RMLS uh, website. Um, you know, searching by criteria is kind of frustrating at first, honestly, just because it seems to be kind of slow. It may, it's driving me a little crazy. My internet is pretty good, but it's like, it takes forever. I don't know if it's something that I'm doing wrong. So I might get a, I might get some sort of consult, like a private session with the RMLS if they can walk me through. I'm pretty tech savvy, but just, just to see if I can get better. Yeah. Um, yeah, so basically I've been looking for homes to send them to the email. Um, yeah, and I've been having like the same problem in Cherry that um, buyer seems to be a little picky when it comes to price, like the smallest budgets as possible for the biggest, I mean, obviously you want the best deal, but um, it seems like there's, there's not enough homes out there to choose from so it's either what is what you get <laughs> almost yeah yeah, yeah. so I've been, well having, I've been having that issue because there's just not enough homes to like be picky anymore so absolutely all right we have shana hey so i did my first solo open house this last weekend Unfortunately, thank you. Unfortunately, the open house wasn't in the greatest area in Salem. Um, not a great location, so there just wasn't any traffic, which is sad. Definitely felt like a waste of time, but also I'm trying to take from it just that um, to, to look a little more at the listing before I jump at doing an open house, make sure it is worth my time um, if yeah. I'm going to invest, especially four hours. Yeah. Um, um, aside from that, I've been networking, getting back in touch with people um, that I haven't talked to in a while. I actually volunteered to do CMAs for two of my family members, um, just basically for practice for me and to put me in the top of their frame of mind so that if somebody does bring up real estate around them, they'll, they'll 
I don't know, subconsciously think of me because they know that I'm capable. So I started volunteering to do that and I'm working on that. Um, I'm also working on getting my days blocked out better so that I have a more structured day because right now I'm really struggling with um, being all the places that I need to be as far as I, I am doing bold and this class and um, a couple of other trainings scattered here and there throughout plus trainings with um, different like Tycor has got me in a couple of trainings this week and I'm just having trouble structuring my day to be in all of those places and then still be able to do my lead gen yeah so, yeah keep it focused on the lead gen and let you know other things fall aside or come later if it's obstructing it yeah thank you perfect um great mckenna sorry hey sorry i'm uh I'm trying to get lunch on the table. Um, my week's been good. It's been pretty busy. I have been connecting um, with this girl who does some work through, um, anyways, basically I've just been networking, meeting with people, um, trying to get some open houses, but I've been doing a lot of volunteer work at my church and babysitting has not been working out very well. Um, like I just went to a meeting with my son with me, which I mean, it was fine. He's good and everything. But um, I think I, uh, I need to kind of structure my day a little bit better too now. We found out preschool isn't happening. So I'm like, okay, I'm really gonna need to figure out what that is going to look like. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just mostly a lot of networking. Um, uh, maybe a couple of potential leads. I'm just waiting for their, um, my friends to get back to me about it. But yeah, we're making awesome. it. Job. Use the restroom. I don't need to go. All right. I know she just got a new lead too. I'm going to introduce Ben, our instructor. So Ben graduated from the University of Oregon in 2000 three and started real estate in 2005 as a buyer's agent on his dad's team. They're quite the family biz business. His dad still is with KW in this office and then his sister now is as well. He has three children and is married to his wife, Kendall. Ben has taught Ignite in the past and firmly believes in continuing education. He's on our agent leadership council here in the Eugene Market Center. Um, and runs the wellness committee and he uh, will be a really really great person for you guys to learn with he's done a great job at building his business um, based off his sphere and networking and referrals and um, really building those relationships so I will let him take it away thank you very much um, I heard a lot of great things today guys I know um, you know most everyone here is a new agent. It's been in the business not that long. And, and what I'm hearing that's that's really good from you guys is you're, you're working on blocking out your days, um, mm -hmm. continuing to do your lead generation. I hear some of you guys are struggling with that. Um, I'm 15 years in the business and I still struggle with, uh, you know, time blocking and blocking out our days. And especially today when we have, um, you know, all that's going on with the Zoom calls and, um, you know, things just come up. Um, you know, buyers will call, hey, you know, when buyers want to see a house for me, at least lately, it's been, hey, I got to see this house uh, today. You call and you look at it and they got two or three offers. So we really have to kind of change our days as they go and, uh, you know, and, and really adapt each day. So but time blocking um, is one of the things that's kind of made me successful over the years. Every day from nine to 12 is my lead gen time. And so in bold, they would teach us to have a calendar that's blocked out by 15 minutes and you'd highlight. So if it's yellow or green or whatever, those are things that absolutely you have to do. You have to do that to continue your business to grow. So, you know, just because something falls off or something comes up doesn't mean you can't, you can't put it back on your calendar later. And if anybody, um, when I say that I have some of these sheets, if anybody wants some of these things, write, write down a checklist as you go and then email me later. I'm happy to send you some of these sheets that, that I use to help organize my day. Okay. So making and receiving offers, you guys have talked about lead gen, how we get leads, how we follow up with them, and now we've gone to the good part, the offer part, right? Um, so today, basically, we're going to go over what it means and how we do it when we present a, a, buyer, a buyer's offer to a seller and how when we write the buyer's offer. I'm not going to go off, go over the actual 
um, RMLS forms to offers themselves. There are some classes that they teach and there are some recorded classes even that you guys can look at. But um, we're gonna go more, more over the, the general of, of uh, what we need to do to prepare to write the best offer, how we win that offer. Because right now, if we have buyers, especially in the 350 and under range, chances are you're gonna be writing a few different offers. Okay, and we'll go over that a little bit more in detail. So, um, you know, if you look at the funnel on the bottom of page nine, if you guys have this, it basically shows the leads to appointments, to agreements, to contracts. And so it goes, it gets smaller, you know, basically in half every time. Not every lead's gonna turn to an appointment, not every appointment's gonna turn to a contract, et cetera. Um, so, you know, we, all of our hard work's paid off um, and the offer is basically first of several steps where we're gonna be dealing with, um, dealing with business instead of finding, okay? But again, you know, we were always in the lead generation business. It's easy to get um, kind of distracted. You get four or five deals going and, and you kind of lax on that lead gen business. That's, that's been the, the worst for me and, and how I've had a lot of these ups and downs over the years is I'll get super busy and I'll stop lead generation um, or even my lead follow-up. And then you kind of go in this trough. And so, what, you know, you're always going to have this as a real estate agent, but what you want is, is, is to, to always be going up steadily. Okay. You're always going to have waves and dips. Um, there's things that come up that are out of our control, but the one thing that's in our control is that lead gen. And you're gonna hear me say it a lot and preach it a lot, but I'm telling you, the busier you get, you just gotta keep up on those lead gen numbers because they 90% of agents' business, they do this and they're troughs. And it took me a long time to get out of that. So please, I, I'm hearing great things. I hear um, people going to garage sales, uh, leaving, leaving business cards, making cold calls, uh, doing CMAs for family members, I forget who said that, but um, you know, keep up on all that stuff. It, it does, equate to top of the mind awareness um and so just keep up on that please do i, I think that's more important than than even learning how to make a, a, a successful offer okay so keep up on that so the offer on the buyer side process and this class is not going to take three hours today my goal is to get you out in like an hour and 15 okay if anybody has any questions raise your hand up jump on in this is an open forum i'm used to teaching in classes i'm still getting used to the zoom so please if anybody has any questions just pop your hand up okay um, or, or chime on in, okay? So, you know, whether we represent in a buyer or seller, making an offer or presenting an offer, it's another opportunity for you to shine. Um, for me, the most business that I get is actually when I'm uh, conducting an offer with a buyer or a listing with a seller. I'm always asking them for business before the listing, during the listing, after the listing. You're gonna find that, um, like when you buy a car, say, okay, you go to buy a car from the car dealership and you buy, a, like for me, I bought a white Tundra. As soon as I got that car or I was looking for that white tundra, I saw them everywhere. The same thing happens. It's top of mind awareness with buyers and sellers out there. During a contract, they're going to be talking. That's all they're going to be focused on. That's all they're going to be talking about their friends, their coworkers. So they're going to have more um, opportunities to send you those referrals. But a lot of times they don't know to refer you. Our buyers, even our A-plus clients, they're not out there trying to get you business every day. But if we ask them and remind them, hey, I'm always looking for a business, anyone looking to buy, sell, invest in real estate, family, friends, referrals, things like that. When someone is buying, they're gonna run into other people that are buying, okay? Right now, rents are super high. A lot of people are switching over to buying right now from renting if they can. Are you talking so, to yourself? Say again. Okay. Oh, excuse me, I thought someone asked something. Um, so again, uh, just keep that in mind that, that, you know, a lot of times buyers will say, I asked a buyer once and they said, well, I thought you were so busy with me that you wouldn't want my referrals. I didn't know somebody that was going to buy. And so that was a shame on me for not asking. Okay. So um, whenever I do buyer consultations, I set that expectations up front. I heard someone else say today that, you know, their buyer has unrealistic expectations or something like that. Every one of you guys should be doing a buyer consultation and setting these expectations in the beginning. It's going to lay down a roadmap for your buyers and it's going to lay a clear, concise, hey, this is what's going to happen when we're looking for houses, when we're searching, how we're going to look at them, and then what's going to happen in the offer stage and what kind of timelines and things are going to happen there. But if you also say, hey, if I do a great job for you during this whole process, is it okay if I ask you for any referrals along the way? It's going to plant that seed that, okay, hey, my, my, my agents will work by referral, especially if you got those people by referral. Um, you know, for me, 95% of my business literally comes from those referrals. So just something to keep in mind. Um, and again, but we've got to do a good job to get those referrals, right? So right now, it's an interesting time. Um, when this COVID stuff happened in February, March, we all thought the market would go, you know, kind of, kind of slow down a little bit. Our inventory came out last month, so we're at 0.9 months. So for buyers right now, it's very, very difficult. They get discouraged. Um, so the better we can make an offer for these buyers and the better we can compete with the other offers, it's going to help us. I'm, I made an offer last night for a house over in Santa Clara. We were one of seven offers. We didn't get it. We offered 21,000 over asking price. We didn't get it. And the house was 299. Okay. So it's a silly time right now. It's crazy. Okay. Um, 
so right now there's definitely a loop. Buyers make an offer, usually, uh, you know, most of the time, unfortunately, they get, either get a rejection or a counter. Um, to reject an offer back in the day was just crazy. You never rejected it unless they were the biggest jerks and low ball 50 grand, okay? You, that's the, the absolute last um, thing you, you, we want as, um, as a seller or on the buying side. But most of the time right now, if you're, if you're making those competitive offers, even if they're competitive like the one I just made, you get rejection. So it's always kind of a loop and your buyers will get used to that. A lot of times they get you know, discouraged um, and there's anxieties. There's a lot of highs and lows, but setting those reasonable expectations with your consult is gonna help you guys a lot, okay? So on the buyer side, you know, emotions running high with both sides, um, you know, remind, reminding the buyers that we're the agent uh, and we're always calm and reassuring and controlling no matter how frustrated the buyers get. You know, I always tell my buyers, hey, we just need one. We just need that one offer, okay? So preparing to write, right now we're gonna go over on the buyer side, preparing to write the offer, getting as much information as we can. Obviously a lot of the stuff's virtual nowadays. Writing the offer, how to be exact, double checking, and then presenting that offer to the listing agent. Um, when I first started, there was a, a little bit of time, um, 05 to 07, where sometimes you'd ask the seller to come to the office and you present directly with the seller. Those times are gone now. Um, that's why you see on some of the disclosures on our MLS disclosure, our, our Keller Williams disclosure, we take a listing, that you want the agent to make that offer directly to you. That all stemmed from um, a lot of old school, more seasoned agents would say, hey, I want to make an offer to the seller. But we don't do that. We, we basically present to the listing agent to present to the seller. Okay. So um, the checklist that I use um, on page 13, this is actually going to be really good, especially when you're starting out, obtaining the buyer's pre-approval from lender. For me as a listing agent, if I get an offer and there's not a pre-approval, I don't even like pre-qualification letters. Now I know some banks, they use pre-quals and it means pre-approval, but if I don't at least have a pre-qual or pre-approval, I tell that agent, I'm sorry, I cannot present your offer. Now there's exceptions. If it's Sunday at noon, um, you know, and they say, how get you one first thing Monday morning, I know this buyer's approved, that's one thing, but you're, you're the professional and we need to not only um, maximize on our work, but, you know, show our buyers that we're doing everything we can. So I tell my buyers and the buyer consults, hey, you know, if you're not pre-approved, you need to get that pre-approval letter so you have it on standby. Yes, we'll get one catered to the property we're offering, but that's something you guys always have to have with your offers. Producing a CMA. I've heard a couple of you say that you guys are doing CMAs. That's awesome. Keep doing it. Do CMAs for each other's listings. Sometimes I'll go and preview properties when I first started out, especially because I did buyers for the first five years. So when I switched from buyer's agent to, to taking listings, that was a big shock for me. Okay. For me to price homes, I mean, I would always have a gut feeling when I worked with buyers, but I would go on a realtor tour, take a look at a house, go back to a CMA, see if I could come up with that same price. So, you know, you guys can each bounce off each other. If one of you takes a new listing, send it out to everyone else. Hey, what is your opinion on the price here? You'll get practice doing that. And it's also good feedback, especially when you're new to make sure you're pricing the house where you think. I still have times where I don't know. Um, and I'll go and I'll ask another professional, I'll ask Larry Alberts across the hall here. Hey, what do you think on this house? And when his CMA comes in spot on, I know I did a good job. If, it's, if there's a discrepancy, I'll go back and look at it again. But um, I had an agent say one time, why would I do a CMA on the buyer's side? One, to get practice, to learn. And it's also to show your buyers that you're not just saying, yeah, let's offer 10 grand over. You're saying, hey, I looked at everything that's happened in that neighborhood. Here's where I think we should come in at. Um, you know, my buyers, when I did the buyer consult and I say, Hey, you know, when we're out looking for houses. My goal is for you guys to walk into a house one day and say, yeah, Ben, this, this house is overpriced. So we want to counsel our buyers the best we can, um, not only to make a good offer, but also um, a strong offer. Okay. But a good offer for them where they feel like they're getting a good deal. And they're not just coming in over asking price because they have to. Okay. Reviewing the tax records. So we all have an RLID account here. Um, if you don't see the front desk, our lids basically are county record search. Most of the time, not most of the time, I'd say 50% of the time, you're going to find discrepancies in there. It's just, I, I live in a newer house. Mine has discrepancies. Brand new houses, sometimes the, the, the way that a, a county records is different from the information stated. But I always look on there to make sure year built is an important one, especially if it's an older house. Is it pre-78? Do you have a lead-based paint disclosure? Do you have stuff you got to worry about there? If it's pre-78, then you got issues with peeing and paint if you have FHA and VA and sometimes conventional ones. So always looking at those tax records looking for price history, when's the last time it's sold? Um, because it seems like buyers always ask, what did the sellers pay for it? And we always tell them, it doesn't matter what the sellers paid for it, but it's always a question that I get asked a lot. Well, what do they buy it for? And when you say, I don't know, it kind of makes you look like, that. for them, that's the most important thing, price, right? So I always look at those county records, and especially if I know that they're gonna be making an offer, I'll have that right next to the MLS sheet. Um, biggest thing I look on there is flood zones. 
Okay, we know some areas up in the hills are way out of the flood zones, but FEMA's adjusted the maps over the last few years. And sometimes there's some Santa Clara properties that'll pop up in a flood zone. The last thing you want is to get into a transaction, and this has happened to me. You're two weeks in, they paid for an inspection, they paid for an appraisal, they're in this thing, 1300 bucks, and the lender comes back and says, hey, I see you're in a flood zone. That buyer's gonna fire you, they should, okay? That happened to me once. I had to pay for a full year's flood insurance up front, and I felt awful, and they never referred me. Um, so that's probably the biggest one where you're going to look at, especially in some of the Santa Clara River Road areas. Ensuring the property is still available. That should be at the top of the list right now. For me, when a buyer says, hey, I want to look at this house, first thing I do, call that agent, text that agent. Do you, how many offers do you have, pretty much? And what's your offer response time? So, um, you know, especially new buyers at the beginning, they're not going to want to compete a lot. It's hard for them. It's very bewildering when you tell the buyer, hey, let's look at this house. We'll, we'll meet there at five. There's eight offers in or there's six offers in. It just sets a defeat up. But if you can kind of get in front of that and say, hey, good news. Yeah, there's offers in on that, but we have until tomorrow at noon. So that means we can look at it tonight, we can sleep on it, we can even look at it again in the morning. So just kind of flip that script around a little bit where, you know, again, if you set those expectations that, hey, you know, we're approved up to 295 and we need closing costs, it's going to be a bumpy ride, you know. Um, so ensuring the property is still available. Um, when, when I speak with a listing agent, I try to develop as much rapport as I can. Now, I've done a lot of business with a lot of the different agents here in town. So if anyone's in here over two or three years, I usually know them. Um, if not, I always look to develop those rapport, that rapport with those agents. Um, because if it is up, you know, say there is three or four offers that these guys are presenting to the listing agent and you're right there neck and neck with another offer and the seller says, who do you think I should work with? Well, you know, I've worked with Ben. He's a great agent. He pays attention to timelines. He made his closing dates last time I worked with him we're all on the same team. You know, the worst thing is when I work with a buyer or work with the listing agent or buyer's agent or listing agent, and there's some, you know, we're bumping heads. We're constantly, you know, and there's a couple agents in town that, you know, I'm not going to name names, but it seems like it's always, we're always kind of, there's friction there, no matter how nice it is, you know, um, we're all in this in the same thing, the buyer, the seller, the buyer's agent, the listing agent, everyone wants us to close. We all want to get a house for our clients. We all want to do a good job. We all want to get paid. So everyone's on the same team. So you might as well develop the best rapport that you can with those agents. All right. And the, the easier we make their job, the better. Okay. If we, if we submit an incomplete offer, incomplete offer, that's already setting us up for, okay, well, you know, he, I still got, I'm missing an initial here. So double checking all that stuff on that, on this checklist and presenting that to them, um, it's going to make their job easier, which is what we want to do, especially when they got to present more than one offer. Asking questions uh, to the listing agent and discovering what's important to the seller. So we call those hot buttons, right? Um, not always is price the, the biggest factor. Sometimes it's occupancy after close for the seller, especially if they're buying another place. Um, you know, it's just, I won an offer in Benita on Ferndale. It's in escrow right now. We were one of five offers, I believe. And we won that offer and we weren't the highest price. We wrote a really great cover letter. Um, we said we had closing costs. If the appraisal did come under, we offered that. We said, hey, you know, we, we are asking for closing costs because money's so cheap right now. But in the event the appraisal came in under what we're upping the sales price for our closing costs, we have that difference to pay. So that put the seller at ease. A lot of sellers right now, uh, listing agents, are looking at offers going, hey, that we got 15 grand above our asking price. That's great. But when people start tacking closing costs onto there, now we've got to have this thing appraised for 20, 21,000 over the asking price. Okay. So again, um, finding out what's important with those sellers. A lot of times if they're like, hey, we're buying another house, we're two weeks from closing, we'd love to rent back for three days. You write a nice clean cover letter saying, hey, you know, we're in a lease till the end of September. You guys can take all the time you want. Give us 20 bucks a day or the cost of our uh, interest a day. You guys can stay there. So again, do as much. This is our, we get one shot. Okay. Escalation clauses, it seems like are out nowadays. People are calling for the highest and best. Highest and best isn't just price. So again, we'll go over some cover letter ideas later, but, um, you know, asking those questions and finding out what, what is the hot button for that seller. Okay. Inquire about activity. How many showings have you had? That's a perfectly logical question to ask. They've said they've had 10 showings and they got eight offers. Well, you, you kind of can set that to your, you, you, when you discuss that with your buyer, um, you know, you, you give them that same information so they can make the best decision for them as well. Um, obtaining a seller's disclosure statement. This has kind of always worked in reverse lately, but it seems like once you get an escrow, then they ask for the seller's disclosure statement. I put online in MLS so buyers have that right away. There's no question about um, you know, when do I get the disclosures? Because we get busy, we forget to make those. So um, I always ask for them um, if they're not a bit attached in MLS, but I would get in the habit of going ahead and doing that. Find out if there's been other offers. Um, most of the time you make an offer nowadays um, and you're one of three offers, it's usually 
well, the, there's not a lot of um, previous offers, it seems like nowadays. It's, you know, if, if they have three, they're usually going to get get in uh, with one. So writing the offer. So uh, top of page 14, I don't know if you guys have the same one we do. Um, ensuring your buyers knows that all checks and earnest money are written at the same time of the offer. That's not really our, our what we do here in, in Oregon. We don't have to have that check written during the offer. Um, we don't have to have it in our possession, at least. You know, our, the way that ours is written up, it's three days after acceptance. Um, it's uh, obtaining the appropriate forms. Again, older houses, sometimes you need a lead-based paint disclosure. Sometimes you need the, the form. So knowing what forms you need for which house, bringing your laptop with you to, uh, to review the offers. I write most of my offers in the kitchen of the house. I bring an offer with me, and um, I always have a blank offer uh, in my briefcase. If I know that I, we're going there, we're probably going to make an offer. I'll have everything written up and leave some areas out. One thing that I still do, um, and I advise a lot of new agents to do it, is when you first start writing offers, write them in ink. So pr print out your form. One, you're gonna learn how to use that form really well, and you're gonna learn what goes what. But you know, if, if, a, if an offer is new to us, a 10-page offer form is new to us, it's gonna look foreign to the buyer. And so if everything's typed out in there, it's hard for the buyer to look at the bullet points. When I write in a blue pen, price, name, everything, I basically say, hey, this is a boilerplate contract with the exception of what's in blue. So what's in blue kind of pertains to us for the most part. So um, you're going to learn the offer better and it's going to be easier to present, especially if you're not super familiar, you know, you get stuck. You just look, okay, where's my next mark? Okay. Right there. Um, and you fill it out with the buyer while you're in there. So that's something that I still do to this day. If I can, I, I just, it's easy for me. I can flip through and I can look for the things. Most importantly for me, you'll hear me talking about a lot of cover letter. Always have your buyers write a solid cover letter. If they don't want to, for some reason, ask their permission to write a cover letter. There's plenty of them online. It's silly, silly, silly not to write a cover letter, especially when we're trying to outcompete some of these other, other buyers out there. There's a lot of investors in the market right now. If I'm selling a house and they, you know, my buyer, my, my sellers raise their kids there and they get three offers and, we'll, and say the, there's an owner-occupied buyer and an and a, um, investor buyer, non-owner-occupant non investor, and the prices are the same, most of the time they're going to go with the people who say, hey, I'm starting a family. We've been looking for a long time. We love the swing set you built for your kid three years ago. So writing those cover letters, it's never going to do any harm. You know, if it's a bank, maybe I won't write a cover letter. Okay, they, they're, they're kind of soulless when they pick offers. They want the highest and best. But for the most part, those, these cover letters have helped me. Here's one that I just had uh, written on a house that we made in Dexter, and we did win the offer. Okay. And again, I'm not saying you're always going to win, but I've won more than I've lost with the cover letter, okay? So I'll just read this to you real quick, um, just to kind of give you an idea of what my cover letters look like. This is one my, my buyer wrote, and he at first he didn't want to write it. Um, his wife wrote the first one, it was like two sentences long. I said, you got a good start. Let's, let's, uh, let's expand this a little bit. Uh, and, I, and I gave him basically four points that I would do when they, when they wrote an offer, but here's what they wrote. They said, uh, dear Mr. and Mrs. Seller, we really appreciate the opportunity to try and purchase your amazing property and home. Already having a strong relationship with one of your neighbors, we know you're surrounded by good people, which is important to us as we start our family. Both of our families have been in the area over 40 years, my dad teaching at the local high school from the mid-70s until 2000. We've already been instructed by our neighbors, the Swartzes, that there must always be horses on the property as they love looking at them. We're more than happy to hear that the horses currently on your property wanted to stay, and we will be happy to continue work with the leaser if you allow us to purchase this property. My wife's family has been Hayne Fields and Dexter, Cresswell and Cottage Grove for many years, and we have many people excited to work the property if we are able to buy your place. Our intention is to close, this is a good one, our intention is to close as fast as possible, as we know that is your desire, and will help us use our connect, and we will help use our connections to make this happen as we both work for Oregon Community Credit Union, who will be doing our mortgage. Again, thank you for considering our offer. And we hope to know that your prop hope you to know that your property will be going to someone who really appreciates all you've done. So there's a few things in there. One, they're, they're saying that they're going to try to close as fast as possible. I wouldn't have known that that was what they really wanted if I hadn't called earlier and talked to that listing agent and found out what their desires were. They had already purchased a place in Redmond. They wanted to close ASAP, ideally before their first mortgage was due on their place. Okay, so there's one. Hot button number one. Some people would have put, hey, I'll give you a long close because you live out in the country. We'll do a 45-day close. We'll give you time to move out. That's not what these bought. These sellers were ready to go. They were packed yesterday. So we found out they needed to move fast. We put that in the cover letter. Okay. Um, talked about being pre-approved, complimenting on their house. My people weren't horse people. They'll never have a horse out there, but there was someone that, that leased, that was a huge barn. I mean, there's, they're only going to use part of this land, but th they said that, um, one, another thing that, that was important for the seller, the people that they were leasing out a couple stalls to, they'd been there for 12 years 
And these sellers felt absolutely horrible. They were selling this place because I guess those are hard to find places where you can stable horses. So my client went in and said, hey, no problem. They could stay as long as they want. We're okay with the 50 bucks a month, which was super cheap to do what they were doing. But again, they really wanted this house. It was a good deal. So right away, we're, we're ahead of any other offer, at least an offer that's the same price without a cover letter. Okay. So cover letter, super important. There's so many of them online. But I just tell my clients, you know, hey, thank them for the opportunity. Talk about how you're lucky enough to buy. You know, if there's weird pink blue wallpaper in the living room and they love it compliment them on the blue and pink wallpaper we're not bsing but we're basically trying to we're trying to smooth the cell we kind of are bsing a little bit sometimes right we don't necessarily like everything they've done but you can always find something to compliment on the house um, again finding those hot buttons especially if it's some a younger you know someone looking to start a family you know it's, it was a family home that where they raised kids i always try to you know put that in there as well so uh talked about the cover letter summarizing the offer um when i do if a buyer calls and says, hey, Ben, ready to go, ready to write the offer, go ahead and write it up on what we spoke about. When I meet with them, I'll always have a summarized bullet page, okay? And when I present the offer, too, to the agent, I never just attach it and say, here you go, go and, uh, you know, here's the offer. I, I'll always break it down. I actually, I have an important, in my important documents, an email. I have um, offer submittal, that's the email subject, and I'll literally go on there and copy and paste that each time, and I'll go and fill it out. My buyers are offering this zero closing costs or 5,000 closing costs. Here's our offer, um, ba basically just our 10 points that we went over on that uh, page four, or 13. Page 13. Yeah, on page 13, I kind of just go over those, um, all those different offer bullet points. And again, you, those can carry over from, from um, pres uh, offer presentation. Humanizing the offer, we talked about the cover letter, yes. Were you saying that that was kind of your version of the cover letter in that email, basically a summary of the offer before the documents are attached? Did I understand that correctly? Yeah. So in the body of my email, you know, hey, Amy, here's my offer for one, two, three Main Street. Just to let you know, our buyers are going to be offering. You know, here's the here's here's the the gist, the bullet points of our offer, and I'll just put offer price, um, inspection contingency, close date, any personal items we're asking for, washer dryer, refrigerator curtains um just summarizing that for that for that listing agent was again if these guys get six or seven offers i mean sometimes i'll call an agent and they'll say hey i got seven offers and i'll tell them you're right and you can almost hear them sigh like oh because they know they got it down and it's just another offer it's more paperwork for them so again the easier we can make them uh their job especially in the beginning sometimes i'll get an offer and it'll just be offer attached and they don't even put their name on it then I got to go through and find it, make sure I'm reading it right. Another reason too is what if you accidentally one day leave, leave some closing costs out, but you put in your email subject, we're asking for 5K in closing costs. And just that one time you accidentally left that out. You were busy and you didn't put that in the offer. What if that was accepted? What if there was a discrepancy they could have caught before that offer was presented or, and or accepted to that seller? So I always spell it out in an email nice and, nice and neat um, and not make the agent go and fumble around searching for it, okay? What would happen in that situation if you wrote it in the summary, but then forgot to write it in the contract? Well, hopefully that agent would catch it and the sellers would catch that, but not always the case. If that came back accepted, you'd be in Tom Dye's office trying to figure out what to do. It'd be a sticky situation, you know. Um, gotcha. okay. It'd be bad. Yeah. I had a comment on the, um, on it would be bad. I was like, what is the recourse there? But the, it basically, you just mean it's a secondary catch. Um, which makes total sense. Um, I had a quick question about the cover letter. We wrote cover letters on our last two houses and we added a cute little picture with our babies. <laughs> hey, that's one of them. Um, and, you know, just to let them know, yeah, we're, you know, starting our family and we're very excited about this. Do you think that's too much? Is that okay? Like it worked out Absolutely for us. That's okay. I think that's a great idea. I've done that. I've done those in the past. I, I forget to ask for those. Um, even now. That's a great point you made. Yeah. You throw a cover letter uh, with a picture in there of the kids. Yeah. I mean, it's stuff that can't hurt. I really, I really think that there's, there's no negative out of it. And I try to think of that over and over again, if it's an investor selling it and they're calling for highest and best offer and to be submitted online, you know, if at hud.com, you know, maybe then you don't need one, but I always do one. And if my buyers tell me, you know what, I just, I don't want to do it. I'll ask them, may I write one on your behalf? And you can approve it before I send it. I won't put any personal information. So yeah, um, I'm a solid, solid believer of the cover letter. Most offers I get never have one. As a listing agent, I, I don't see a lot of offers with cover letters. So that's good. That's telling you guys, there's not a lot of people out there making them, right? Okay. Awesome. Thank I you. I like that idea on the picture. That's great. 
um, creating a buying loop. So when we hear the term loop, we're, um, basically that was the old system for KW. Now they're, um, it's in command, right? And we can, we can invite different parties. I'll go over this really quick, but we can invite the buyer's agent. We can invite the buyer or the seller to this uh, platform, um, especially if you're presenting you know, three or four offers. You can put three or four offers in there, send it to seller. Seller could literally sit there, decline one, decline one, accept one, and go in and DocuSign. Super fancy, super technology. Um, one thing I like to do at first, I was like, you know what? I'm old school. Um, I, I don't need to go that, that far in technology. But one thing I do, whether I put my buyers or sellers in that, is I'll put the other agent in it. Because again, we're making it easier for that agent. We're also showing off what Keller Williams can do. So if that other agent is at Remax and they don't have that system or they don't use it as much, they're like, well, what is this? Look at this. I can go in here and, and accept and, and submit disclosures online and it's got a date of when it's submitted. Um, it's just, it's kind of bragging about what Keller Williams can do to the other agent. So um, not a lot of people use those yet, but I've been starting to use it just to keep in touch with the other agent. And honestly, it makes it easier because when a buyer DocuSigns something, it automatically sends it to them. Okay. So. Something to look at. There's some classes on that. I'm sorry to jump in again. No, My you're fine. Kind of iffy sometimes. Um, are you talking about the DocuSign like uh, website? Is that what you were talking about? So it's within now? opportunities. So if you go to um, uh, agent.kw, you know, we're our platform where we do our contacts and command. So if you go to opportunities there, um, you know, if it's a listing, you can you can start a listing. But then there's an offer tab there, and you can upload up to. I mean, I think five, six, however many offers you want. And again, it breaks it down in a little bullet points and you can share that with the seller. You can say, hey, I just sent you five offers. I'll go over the ones, the strong ones, but go ahead and take a look. Because you go over an offers with, with sellers, especially if it's via Zoom, they'll get that all in an email spelled out, offer number one, two, three, four, all nice and neat. And they can literally press reject, reject, accept, reject. Okay, so okay. It's, just, it's just a way I to stay organized, yeah. I'm sorry, you cut out. Can you say that again? I had misunderstood. I thought you meant you were sending it to the seller's agent, um, but you're talking about with your client sending them to them, so it's just super user friendly. Yeah, you can, you can also send that to the seller's agent. Once you have an accepted deal, you can put them in oh. on that on that command loop, so that they're basically just in touch with. Uh, they can stay in touch with everything else. Um, Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So, so let's see here. Checklist for writing a, an offer. So we went over the checklist for preparing the offer. Um, checklist for writing the offer. To, uh, top page fifteen. I, I'm going to kind of go through this quick. You know, a lot of the stuff. But price and terms. You know, you want to. You want to. If it's the call for highest and best, I usually tell my buyers. You know, they, they'll look to us for advice. But how much should we offer over? What's enough? I'll share them with my opinion. Hey, I know past two or three offers. If the house is three hundred, you probably got one at three ten. If you're going to go 310, go 311, go 1,000 over. It seems like a lot of buyers, um, they're going 5,000, $10,000 increments. If someone's going to go 10,000 over, have them go 11, have them go 10, five. It's 500 bucks. It's 1,000 bucks. You know, um, I, don't, I don't see a lot of those offers with exact numbers like that. It's usually 5,000 over, 10,000 over. But, you know, what I tell my buyers is, look, I'm not going to, it's your money. I, you know, it's how much you like the house. Uh, the way that I describe it to my buyers is I say, Offer a price, your best foot forward, but offer a price that if I called you tomorrow and I said, hey, you did not get this house, offer a price where you'd be like, you know what, that's okay. I'm okay not getting that house at that price. At 310, I was good with it. I, I'm, if I didn't get it, more power to the other buyers, you know? So I just tell, that's how I explain it to my buyers. And then, you know, I'll counsel them and show them that CMA. If you have a CMA, again, you can show them comps, especially if they're talking about offering over asking price. If they ask you, well, what the one down the street sell for? Buyers often know the market more than we do, guys. And that's not a good thing. So when a buyer says, well, what the one three doors down sell for two months ago? I saw it on Zillow. And if you go, oh, shit, I, I, you know, I don't know. I have to go on my phone real quick, you know? Buyers, they're going to wonder like, okay, well, you know, this guy's telling me to offer 12,000 over, is he right? He doesn't even know that one was down, 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 the, down the road for sale. So um, I can't tell you how many times I pulled up to a property and I just done a quick map search on my phone, you know, half, half a mile out in all directions, six months, boom, you get everything there. You'll see active pendings sold over the last six months. Just look at them real quick. Look at the prices real quick. Look at the price per foot in a summary. Okay. There's a lot of buyers. They'll say, what's my, what's the price per foot? Zillow's kind of pound that into them. So they see the price per foot and the estimate, right? So they'll ask you those questions. So if you have that and you say, Hey, I, I know this market really well. It's 236 a foot. The last one sold for 232, but that had RV parking. You're just, you're ensuring that, you, that 
they are in good hands. And again, we want to ask for referrals during the transaction. So we, you know, if we show them that we're the real estate professional that knows all our numbers that we should, we should know all those numbers. Um, it just helps us out. Okay. Talked about the seller's disclosures. Not a lot of them are in MLS. I like to put mine in there just because I know that they've, they've received it. They should have got it right away. Um, I don't have to worry about remembering that. The worst feeling is you get it one week from close and you go, oh my gosh, I never sent the disclosures. It's embarrassing too when you're on the other side of it and you're representing the buyers and you're sending them disclosures. You know, the CD's gone out and you're sending the disclosures. Okay. If anything's on there that's iffy, you know, that could be a, a weird time right there. Right. So, yeah. Um, I always ask for them if they're not in MLS, especially if you're gonna to prepare to write the offer. Is it in the flood zone? Does it have LP siding? Can we save some of this work right now? Can we, can we not waste our time making an offer and instead show them another house if we know the house isn't gonna work based on something that's on those disclosures? Okay, conveyances. They say you're not a realtor until you purchase a refrigerator. Okay, ever heard, anyone's ever heard that? One day you'll get into a deal and you'll come down, you'll, you'll get the keys and you walk in and there'll be a washer dryer that's missing or a refrigerator or drapes. Well, I left the window coverings, the drapes weren't window coverings. I always just put it in the offer. Even if it says refrigerator, washer and dryer, and all window coverings are included, I always write in refrigerator, washer and dryer. My, my, my offer pretty much just auto-populates that for me at this point. I go into that line and it says refrigerator, washer and dryer, all window coverings. Now it says in there under fixtures, all window coverings are included. I one time had a client take the drape, the drape rods and the drapes, but left the blinds or it was something like that. I ended up having to pay for some blinds. I haven't had to pay for a refrigerator yet but I had had to pay for some window coverings. Another thing too is if there's a lot of people have two refrigerators, I've heard of a story that this happened where someone put refrigerator, they left the refrigerator in the garage, okay? Not the stainless steel Samsung in the fridge or in the kitchen. Could they get in trouble and, and go after that? Yeah, are you gonna take time? Do you wanna take time and follow up with that after a transaction? You wanna end the transaction on a note of, hey, they took the fridge, you know? The cell, that should be a happy time for your buyer. So I it's just cheap insurance, you guys. Refrigerator, kitchen, washer, dryer, all window coverings. Right. And tell the buyers what's what's expected. When I was new, I had a buyer, and I was so happy to be working with this guy. He was like a seven hundred thirty thousand dollar buyer. His dad came along from California, and he's like, "I want to ask for the couch, this, 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 this." He started asking for all this personal property. And I didn't want to make the guy mad. It was my first big buyer, so I wrote it in there. And that agent called me. I think it was Simon Smith, and he called me. He's like, "You guys asked for furniture. I've never seen that before. Like, like a bed table. I mean, it was a huge addendum of all this stuff." I should have set those expectations to that buyer that, hey, typically you can ask for the refrigerator and wash and dryer sometimes. By the way, I never include them in my listings ever. Even if my buyer or my seller says, Ben, I'm not taking that fridge, I'm not taking that wash and dryer, just give it to them. I still don't include that in the listing and use this as a negotiating point, okay? You can say, hey, I'll, you know, we're gonna count you a, a grand, but we'll give you the wash and dryer. Or, hey, we'll give you the wash and dryer um, and the refrigerator, how about, you know, when repair time comes up, you only ask for lender required repairs. Okay. It's just a, it's just a token. And sometimes those buyers need a win, especially when they're offering 15, 20,000 over right now. If you can give them a small win, make them feel like they've got a win. Hey, my seller didn't want to leave the fridge and wash and dryer, but I'll tell you what, you guys came in with a good solid offer. We're going to go ahead and give it to you guys. Buyers just got a win. Now they're not looking as sticky as hard when the repair dent comes up, right? Because that's another thing I'm seeing now is that buyers are being very, very aggressive on those repair dents lately. And I've seen buyers and sellers, give five grand more or take five grand less. But when it comes to $300 sump pump repair, they'll, they'll go down with the ship. They'll kill the deal over stupid stuff like that. So, you know, again, starting that in, with some positive momentum in the beginning, um, just an idea. You do what you want. Earnest money. What's earnest money in our area? Plus or minus what? About a percent, about a point. It used to be about 2%. So normally, you know, when I started on a $300,000 house, it was about six grand, five, six grand in earnest money. Nowadays, I pretty much do 2,500 bucks across the board. I mean, it's, it's so hard to lose a buyer's earnest money. And in fact, I wouldn't recommend you guys say this, but for me, what I say in my buyer consultations is I guarantee your earnest money, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, with one exception, you will back out the day of closing. Other than that, if it's within our contingencies in this transaction, and I'm going to send you, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, once we get into escrow, I'm going to send you a beautiful checklist. You guys can ask me for this too. Just send me an email of all of our to-do list. If they get an email with the subject line to-do Main Street, and it has a little calendar on it and it shows by Wednesday at 5 p.m. we gotta have earnest money in there. There's number one, number two. Uh, 10 business days from now or you know, September 3rd by 5 p.m. we gotta be through all of our inspection negotiations. So if you outline all these, these timelines up front, um, that's, that's why I say I guarantee earnest money. I've never lost anyone's earnest money, knock on wood, but again, it's, it's just really hard to lose it. So when somebody says, hey, you know, Ben, you only given us 3,000 earnest money, we, we want more like five and it's a $300,000 house. 
you know, whatever, it goes towards a down payment, you're, you're, you're pretty um, solid that you're not gonna lose it, but um, I always do about a plus or minus 1% and usually round down, okay? Time for seller's acceptance. This is a really, really good one that you guys need to get good at. I find out if there is not an offer deadline, I will ask if the sellers are in town. And before I say, hey, how much time do you need? I'll say, hey, if we have a question or concern about this property, are you able to get a fast response from the seller? Oh yeah, they're my neighbors. Or, oh yeah, they're, they do DocuSign. I, I can probably get them in within an hour. Okay, good. Okay, well, we're gonna put by 5 p.m. tonight, but we'll get you the offer by noon, is that okay? Well, you know, can we get till tomorrow at 10? Well, I, you know, my buyers are looking at another house. I thought you said you can get a quick response. So it's not a bait and switch. I'm just finding out, are these guys in town? Are they out of town? Are there two decision makers? Okay, is it a brother and sister? Is it an estate? How fast can we get a response? And some realtors get mad, but I always put by 5 p.m. the next business day. Unless I'm making an offer like right now, then I may do tomorrow at 10 a.m. But if you get an offer from me, it's gonna be less than 24 hours response time, unless there's a dedicated, clean, clear um, um, offer deadline. Okay. I mean, you don't want to be up against another offer if you can get it accepted right away, especially if you're full price. So time for seller's acceptance for me, less than 24 hours. Um, financing terms, make sure that the house will go the certain financing that you're doing. So VA, FHA, they don't like what? Peeling pain. Okay. They don't like exposed junction boxes. Some of that stuff's easy to do, but if you see that it's a, you know, the house is built in 1977 and it needs a full on paint job. You may not want to get all the way down the repair addendum after this buyer spent 450 bucks on inspection to see if they're willing to repaint, scrape the paint and repaint, okay? So if the house is built before that, 1978, before I make an offer, I usually have that conversation with that, with that realtor. Hey, you know, we see that there's a bunch of peeling paint. My buyers are cool with it, but we're an FHA loan. And it says in MLS that you guys show up in FHA and VA offers. I'm sure you guys know that, you know, the peeling paint's got to be resolved. Oh yeah, we have a bid. That's going to be taken care of, no problem. So get ahead of those things. Um, and outlining those financing terms in the, in the beginnings is gonna help you out a lot. Buyer's pre-approval letter, we talked about that. Always have a solid pre-approval letter. Loan approval, um, I believe it's 14 days in the offer when they need to be through their financing uh, contingencies. It's always contingent on their financing up until close. But um, closing date, um, most of the time if it's occupied, I always recommend giving a couple days to move out. It's a nice thing to do and plus as a seller, I wouldn't move out until I had the money anyway. So you're probably gonna get countered on it, which can eat up another 12 hours of negotiation. And um, it's just what we do here in Oregon. If you get buyers from California and you mention this, they'll look at you like you're absolutely nuts. Down there, they don't do possession after closing. They're used to getting keys the day of, day of signing, the day of closing. Um, up here, it's just kind of the norm. You know, we give them a couple days, up to two days to move out. So I'll do a lot of my closings on a Wednesday. If my, my buyer's got a traditional nine to five Monday to Friday job, I'll do a lot of my closings on Wednesday with possession two days after, meaning they get keys Friday. If we need another business days, they get keys Saturday. So, and have those conversations. Again, if you mention that in your buyer consult, your buyer shouldn't be too surprised on that. Home warranties, not a lot of home warranties offered with listings anymore. There used to be probably about one third of them. You'd see um, uh, in the top right, home warranty, yes or no. Look for that, because if you ever see home warranty that says yes and you don't ask for it, you just left 400 bucks on the table. So even if you're, even if you're Buyers don't really care about the warranty if it's a lot of new appliances. And he said, you know, for me, if the appliances are newer and there's no uh, like heat pump or forced air system, I rarely ask for a home warranty. Everything in that house is going to be about four or 500 bucks to replace a water heater, an oven. I mean, if it's used, it's only 450, 500 bucks. I'd rather get 500 off the price and say, hey, we're not asking for a home warranty, but we come in 500 under. So look at that. It's not a lot anymore, but they, they used to have it where, where uh, a lot of sellers law for those. Repair limits, um, again, this is kind of happens after we get our, our inspection back. I, I don't recommend off asking for a lot of repairs up front unless it's something like a roof. Like if we know the roof has two to three years of life in it and it's not gonna pass appraisal and your buyer's not gonna buy it unless they have a new roof, you can always cross that bridge ahead of time and have a discussion with that listing agent. But I rarely put items in the beginning seller to fix this, this, and this. And your buyers, will, that's a perfectly reasonable thing from a buyer standpoint. If you're not a realtor and you're a buyer and you see, oh my gosh, the fence is falling down, are they gonna fix that? There's a broken window, can we ask them to fix that up front? That seems like a perfectly logical thing to ask a seller up front. But of course we all know that, well, you know, we're gonna actually get an inspection report back with that and more. So we'll ask for it all at once when we know what's serious. The windows may be the least of it once we get this inspection back. There may be other things that you want to ask for. So don't really ask for a lot of stuff up front for me, um, it is. Any special clauses or contingencies, okay? So um, closing costs, it's not a contingency, but we wanna make sure we ask for it. A special contingency would be, hey, I got a house to sell. Those are tough sales right now, especially when we're up against other offers. And if we do get accepted, we're gonna go unbumpable and we can get bumped out tomorrow or two days from now. 
But if that is a contingency that your buyers have, you need to put that in there. Okay, and having that discussion with the buyers ahead of time. Okay, you know, hopefully you have the listing if their house is for sale. But um, well, I won't get too far on that. But you know, um, you know what uh, special clauses and the contingencies are. Uh -huh. And then cover letter. We talked about that. Okay. I'm not going to go over the scripts and make you guys do scripts. I find it's really hard to do scripts, uh, scripts and dialogues um, on a Zoom call. But on the top of page 17, you know, when the buyer wants the seller to make repairs, again, we talked about that pre-inspection repairs. You can look through some of this stuff. When the buyer wants to make a low offer, I mean, most buyers, again, if you, if you counsel them and show them the TMO report, the RMLS statistics ahead of time, they're really not going to want to make a low offer. I haven't had a buyer say, you know, I'm going to offer 10, 1500, no matter what it is in a long time. Okay. Presenting the offer to the listing agents. Okay. Um, let's see here. No, we're not going to watch that video. I don't think I can watch videos on this. That's all right. Um, so calling the listing agent, immediately let them know an offer is coming. Again, don't just email them. Let them know, hey, I got an offer coming. It'll be to you by five. We gave it to you till tomorrow at five to respond. Do you have any other offers? Okay. Um, Number two, that's old, that's outdated using eEdge. We now use command. You can invite that listing agent or buyer's agent into that loop to submit offers and have it automatically sent to them. I'd say until you get this down, do everything scan handwriting just for a minute. I mean, some people may say, no, that's crazy, but until you really understand the contract and know it forwards and backwards, I would do everything that way rather than just do it all technology because a lot of that stuff will automatically send, okay? Um, number three, that's my that's that's my uh, motto right there. Request a reply within the shortest amount of time your market will allow. Again, I put tomorrow at five if I'm making an offer, um, or tomorrow at ten if I'm making an offer like right now. So again, I, it it makes the listing agent somewhat doesn't make them mad, but again, if you've asked them, hey, your your sellers in town, can I get a quick reply? Um, and I'll put in the email, hey, I'm really sorry that we only gave you till tomorrow at five to respond to this offer, but we're looking at a house, and I'll look up another house. We're looking at the one on. Uh, on Stark Way, and we don't want to lose that if this doesn't work out. So it kind of puts some sense of urgency in there. And when they tell the seller, hey, they only give us till tomorrow five, yeah, they're looking at another house around the corner. That That's a little seed that you plan with the seller that, you know what, we're not super attached to this house. I mean, it's twofold, right? You want to do a buyer's cover letter, but you also want to know that you're working for your buyer and that you can't wait around for two or three days for other offers to come in. Some sellers play games right now. You know, some sellers, they start out with reviewing offers up front or as they come in and then they'll see they had 13 showings in one day and two offers. Then they'll, what will they do? What will they do? You know what? Let's wait till Friday at five. Let's wait through the open house. Yeah, exactly. And try to get more. So, um, okay. So I was presenting the, kind of to the buyer there. We're about halfway through here representing the seller. So hopefully you have more seller representations than buyer representations. For me, it was a lot of buyers when I started as well as a buyer's agent. Even now, I look at my board, what? Uh, about half right now, about 50, 50 buyers and sellers. Okay. You should be 75, 25, 80, 20, right? Listings, 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 right? Leads, listings, leverage. Then the three L's, once you get that, it's listings, listings, listings. I like working with buyers. I'm one of those outliers that, you know, I'm, I don't like being in the office all day. I like going out and looking at houses. It's hard when I get a 285 buyer that needs closing costs, but, um, I just like, that's just where I started. And that, that's, that's what I do. But, um, Obviously listings are, you, you can get a lot more leads from them, a lot more leverage, you get signed calls. Um, people come to you, right? Especially if you price it right and you price it good, you're gonna get three or four offers usually in that first week. Uh, so when a buyer makes an offer on your, on your client's property, obviously these are simple, receive the offer, gather information about the buyer, present the offer and respond to the offer. If the agent that gives me the offer does kind of remember what I was telling you earlier, sometimes I'll just get an email with the offer and there won't be any information there. I'll call that agent. Hey, how long have your buyers been looking? Have they made an offer on the property? But what do they like about this area? And if an agent ever says, well, you know, why are you asking so many questions? Be like, I'm trying to get your offer accepted. I'm trying to find out more about your buyer. So when I present this offer, I can give my seller detailed information accounting of what your buyer's uh, actions have been. Okay. Um, Presenting the offer to your client, I, I even with the COVID stuff, I still want to do it in person. I always try to present an offer in person. It's really hard to gauge. Like even right now, I you know it's hard for me to look at you guys and know exactly if you guys are you know into everything. This we're on a Zoom call, or if you're if you're bored with it, you know. So when you're across from somebody, hey, well, you know, if it's a ten twenty thousand dollar commission. You can go over to their house and sit with them and go over that with them in, in person. So for me, I like presenting it in person, at least the pre presentation part. And even after that, if you want to do everything electronically. If you have your laptop there, okay, I'm going to send it to you. You can open an email and sign it, especially if you have multiple offers. Again, our clients aren't used to this. People sell maybe, what, once every few years at the most, okay? If, 
they may be overwhelmed if they get an email with five offers, even as nice and clean as that command system is. If you're in, in, in front of them and you have a nice bullet page typed out and you can sit, okay, here's offer number one, here's offer number two, three, four. So I always try to present it in person just like I try to get my offers written in person, okay? Obviously certain things and timelines will, will keep that. Um, first thing I do is I call other buyers agent, whether I know them or not, and I thank them for the offer. Um, I let them know if another offer is coming in, okay? I'm usually communicated with this buyer's agent a few times right now. If they're good and they called, hey, are there any offers, Ben? I'll let them know, no, no offers. We have a couple showings yesterday. One's coming back today. I'll let you know if anyone's making an offer. One day you're gonna work with this person and they'll remember if they got burned, all right? I have a list of realtors that I've worked with. It's not that long, surprisingly, but I, I remember people, realtors that burned me, okay? Um, so I always try to have that nice rapport, be nice, calm, um, and, and deal with them the best I can and communicate. That's one thing I really talk a lot on the buyer side that I'll talk now is communication is so key. It's awful, awful, awful when you make an offer and you just don't hear anything. Or that it, the timeline, the offer expiration is coming up and you haven't heard anything and you gotta call that listing agent. Hey, we gave you till today at five, it's 422. Do we need an extension? You know, Because your buyer's sitting there looking at their watch the whole time. Oh my gosh, it's 4.30, you haven't got a response. My realtor hasn't called me. Is it my realtor or is it their realtor? So I always communicate with those people the best I can. Um, because again, not only you want to do a good job, you want to help them with their buyers and help your seller get, you know, we're all on the same, the same team, but you want to, you want to be able to work with them later uh, in, the, in the future. Okay. So gathering information, I kind of went over this. So I'll just skip through it. How long has the buyer been looking? Are they pre-approved with the lender? That should be number one, right? Uh, do they have anything to sell? Okay. Um, are, are they out of town? If, if they are out of town, why are they moving to the area? Doesn't that may seem like a person that may seem like a personal questions, but your sellers are going to ask that. Uh, most of my sellers will do. If they see a buyer from California and uh, you know they're they're moving here, you should always going to say just just for curiosity why are they moving up here? You know, so um, why did they select this particular property? If they don't have a cover letter, again, if the buyer's agent says, well, why, why do you need to know all this stuff? Said, you know, again, I'm trying to help your buyer get this property. You know, um, I didn't see a cover letter. They're happy to, if they want to write when they can, but I'm just trying to get this information so I can present this offer in full to my seller. How did they come up with their offer price? I don't ask that one, okay? I think that's going to kind of stick them a little bit. So me personally, I don't ask that. Uh, and I'll just leave it at that. Um, have they made offers on other properties? Yeah, then this is the fourth house they've been making, making an offer on. So we made a nice strong offer, you know. Yeah, it's just good information to have, okay? So the more you know, the better you are prepared um, with you and your seller to be able to respond accordingly, okay? Checklist for reviewing offer, just like on page 13 or 14 with the checklist for making, here's one for reviewing. Um, always review the offer in full before you even present or call that seller. Make sure you have everything there. If they put an email with all their bullet points, make sure that those check out. I usually call the agent. Okay, so just to be sure we're making 319 and if there's no closing costs in there, I'll double check that. But you get a lot of closing costs nowadays. Just to be sure, there's no closing costs. They have their own closing costs. Yep. Okay. Just making sure. Even if it's their fault, you don't want to get two, three weeks down the down the down the road and then go get it back to market. Okay. Um, so address. Make sure the address is correct. If there's more than two tax lots, let them know. Put that in MLS. I'm selling a place on Bailey Hill. There's two tax lots. So I put in there when making an offer. Please include tax lot da, 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 and tax lot. Da, 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 da. So make sure that's all in there. Okay. Price. Um, you can usually look at that price and know what your seller is going to do right away. Okay. Earnest money, make sure that the earnest money is okay and it's in there and it's three days after acceptance. Um, uh, time for acceptance, see how long you have. Okay. What I do is when I get an offer is I'll call everyone that's shown that property within the last week and I'll say, hey, just to let you know, as a courtesy, I received an offer. Even if I know those people are out, it's a nice thing to do and they'll remember and most people don't do it. So, you know, when I call those agents, they usually say, oh man, we found another place or uh, as I told you, man, that was a no, but thank you so much for giving me a call and letting me you can also tell your sellers, hey, just so you know, when, I, when you present that offer to the seller, I called 16 people, let them know we have an offer, told them we have until today at five. I don't anticipate any writing, but I try. I try to get you multiple offers, okay? Pre-approval, making sure that the buyer is approved. I call the other lender if I don't know that realtor. Most lenders are really cool about talking with agents nowadays. 10 years ago, it wasn't, it wasn't the case. You get an angry realtor. Why'd you call my buyer's lender? I didn't give you permission to do that. We're not calling and asking for certain information. We're basically calling that buyer's lender and say, hey, what can you tell me about the buyer that helped you get this offer accepted? Okay. It says here they're pre up to 300 and they need 5,000 close costs, 305. What's our DTI looking like? Are we close on ratios? Can they, you know, um, 
And again, when you go over it with your seller, you can say, hey, I spoke with this broker or I don't know this broker, but I talked to him and he says the buyers are really solid. They're actually proof for a little bit more. They were looking at a higher price. So this should go through, okay? Uh, financing terms, again, you know, FHA versus VA versus conventional, depending on the state of the property and the age. You know, again, it's not always about the, the pricing terms. If you get a VA offer and a conventional offer, I love VA, I, you know, but if my node, the house is in, is, is maybe not, well, maybe not um, financeable under VA and all everything else is the same, you know, it's our duty to tell that seller, hey, um, both offers are the same. We're obviously not discriminated on the buyers at all, but based on the age of your house and some of the repairs that you said you don't have money to do, <laughs> conventional may be a little bit easier in the appraisal. I have so, a question. So, yeah. Uh, so why does it make a difference whether they are a BA or a conventional loan? So they get paid anyway. So I just don't know why, what does it make a difference? That's a very good question. You're right. So at the end of the day, a cash is as good as, a, as a, an offer in terms of money's money, right? But there's a better chance of a cash offer going through than there is a conventional offer, okay? There's typically a better chance of a conventional offer going through than um, an FHA or a VA uh, offer sometimes. Ignoring the timelines for some of these appraisals being longer on VA, the state of the house, the condition of the house. So if there's peeling paint, and it's, I keep going back to peeling paint, it's just an example I use, okay? If there's peeling paint and, and the house is 1974, again, our lead-based paint cutoff is what, 1978, right? So if there's a bunch of peeling paint, the VAs, it's zero tolerance for that stuff. You gotta have it all removed. And if you know your seller will not do that or cannot do that, or they just don't have the money to do that, then that's something that you need to have that you need to have that conversation with them. Okay. So when I'm showing a house and I'm representing the VA or FHA buyer and I see some of the items that, you know, if, if, if you have two houses, say, okay, and a conventional appraiser goes through and an FHA appraiser goes through, chances are the VA appraiser is going to require more things to be done if the house is in either a disrepair or an older home. So that's why I, I'm saying that. Yes. Danielle. So in the example where you have a house that has this peeling, peeling paint and it's pre-1978 and you have a VA loan, so they're not going to approve the loan without the repairs, is it possible to have credits applied so that the buyer can do those repairs within a certain amount of time? Would, will lenders usually work with you on things like that? No, the they, they really won't. But they yeah, can they, make, a, make a credit? That's a good question. So yeah, um, not really, because again, these appraisers go through there and they want, you know, a bank lends money with the assumption you're never going to pay and they're going to have to turn around and sell this house. Okay. Uh, lenders offer, you know, mortgage brokers give you loans based on the fact that they got to have all hundred boxes checked so they can sell this loan in the secondary market. So if, in order for a loan to go FHA, all those repairs need to get done beforehand, even if they're little tiny minuscule repairs. Um, there are loan products out there, 203s, Ks, 203B rehab loans. Um, that'll that'll give you the money to do it after they're a lot more work the sellers it's, it's just so much more intensive work that unless it's a full-on remodel which most people aren't accepting nowadays because there's cash buyers out there it's stuff that has to get done ahead of time now sometimes i have no problem going out there and helping those buyers do that repairs i'll say hey let's get a six pack you know 10 bucks in paints and caulking i'll go out there and scrape it if it's a little bit if it's a full-on you know all the window trimming needs to be done there's two years of life on the roof they've disclosed this to you VA and FHA is just a little stricter than conventional. Conventional can still call this stuff too, but I find they they leave a lot more stuff out than, than FHA and VA does. So we're not discriminating on a loan. I want to be very clear with them. We're not discriminating on that. We're just telling the sellers, hey, this is the chance of this going through. We also don't want that buyer to have to spend an inspection and appraisal only to find out the stuff has to get done that we already know needed to get done and nobody's going to do it. Did I understand correctly that when you're representing the buyer and there are small patches of paint or repairs that need to be done, you and the buyer can go make those repairs beforehand? Before I let a deal fall apart and my buyer not get a house, I'll do it. If the seller says, no, what, I'm not doing it, I'm done, they can walk. If they don't get that done, um, I'll tell a buyer, you know, we'll go out and do it. I have water heater straps in my truck. I keep a $15 set of water heater straps. I've probably done 30 of them. No joke. Let's go out there and do it. Sellers you know. don't care. They're like, sure, come do the repair. Most of the time, yeah. I mean, I've, I've never had a seller um, say no. I mean, I always get, I always get permission. And this is again, I'm not just doing this to be nice up front. I'm asking them on a repair addendum. But if they're saying no, we're not going to do this stuff. Or yeah, we'll do it. But I know the appraisals tomorrow, and these guys are going to have to pay a hundred dollar reinspect fee because they didn't get the smoke detectors up. I'll just go do it. Okay. Because most of the time when these people are telling the story to other other buyers and other clients that they're going to refer and they see how my realtor was out there, he called into the house and helped me do stuff. 
my dad used to give me crap for it. He'd say, why you, don't, don't help people do that. That's what you have contracts for. That's what you have this for. You know what, if I can get my buyer that house, you know, we get paid a lot for what we do. Sometimes it's a lot of work, sometimes it's not. But if we can go out there and just do a couple small repairs and the buyers tell that story to somebody, I mean, some of my two, my eight plus clients, they tell this story, they don't do a dog dog. So to unlock a house that we couldn't get into in the country. So if you just go above and beyond a little bit, and we're not, we're not contractors. We're not doing full-on remodels and replacing windows, although I'd have replaced planes and glass too. Um, right now, contractors are hard to find. And if I call a contractor that's booked out a month and I say, hey, I need a water heater strapped installed, a CO detector, and um, you know, a, a little soft that has some peeling paint. Okay, that's what, an $80 job for them? These guys are booked. So it's hard for me to even find contractors. I'll just go out there and do it. If it's a little bit of work, I'll tell the buyers, hey, let's go out there and do it. We'll get it done. We'll make sure it's done before the appraisal happens. You know, I'm not saying you guys have to do it, but it's easy stuff. Okay. It's easy stuff. I didn't realize that was even an option, but Absolutely. from a super family, I'm happy to get out there and get some stuff done if it means we can get this job. Yeah. And again, we're not contractors, but little stuff like that, smoke detectors, CO detectors. I have combos in my in my garage. I have water heater straps in my truck. Um, I just it comes up more than I, more than you know now. There's a lot of times sellers will say, Hey, I'll give you a $20 or I'll give you a hundred dollar credit. You guys do the work. I can't find a contractor to do it. I'll just tell my buyer, you know, what? let's go out there. I'll help you do it. We'll knock it out. We'll get it done before the appraiser gets out there. Last question. I started yeah, monopoly, no but at what point um, are you going to take that step? Basically, if we are in an accepted offer, is that where you're talking? Yeah, a hundred percent. So if we have an accepted offer, we did the inspections um, we've asked for these items and the sellers either come back and said, Hey, um, you know, we're going to do this, but we're not going to do, we're not going to do the, you know, they have to do the detectors. Okay. They have, they don't have to do the water heater straps. That's, that's kind of a financing thing. Um, it should be, they should have to do it because it's pretty much required across the board, but they don't, they don't have to. So if they say, we're going to give you $50 credit, we're not going to mess with any of that stuff. Or we're out of town, we're at a new house, we're not going to mess with any of that stuff. Usually if I can't find a contractor to do that, and if the contractor says, Hey, it's 80 bucks, it's hard for me to tell my clients you know, here's an $80 bill when it's going to cost me 15 bucks in a couple minutes. I'll just go ahead and do it. Then I know it's done and the appraisal doesn't come back and say, we have to do a reinspect just to go look at these water heater straps. It's just a way to go sense. above and beyond. It's not going to come up on every transaction, Danielle, but it's, it's just such an easy um, thing to do and it's easy insurance. And that may not work for some of you. Some of you may say, you know what? I would never touch that. I won't do that. That's not my job. And that's okay too. But for me, I, I've just always done it. You know, it's just one of those things that's easy for me. I've fixed up houses before. It's easy. It, it's just not a problem for me to do that. But yes, we always want to ask the seller, hey, is it okay if we go in there and do this tomorrow at six? After yeah. We go and do that. No, that's awesome. I think I had it in my mind that when you're in contract like that, you would have to be dealing with like licensed contractors for the tiniest things. I mean, we've done repairs as sellers ourselves, but I didn't realize that we could offer that you know what i mean so Absolutely. yeah and stuff like that that you don't i mean i'm not going to go in and rewire something um even if i feel confident doing that or we don't we don't want that liability right but something as easy as throwing a detector up or water heater straps it's just something that always comes up nowadays there's always detectors and water heater straps batteries so um that's just probably one in three transactions i'm usually out there doing something little like that especially if the, if the sellers say hey it's as is we're going to take your offer but it's as is or um you know they're just lagging on the repairs I want to make sure when that appraiser goes out, I, you know, I look out for every dollar my client spends and we do too. We all do, but I don't want them to have to spend 90 to 140 bucks to have an appraiser go out and peek in the window and see there's water heater straps. Well, and if the sellers have already moved to bend, yeah, I'll go talk around that pipe or whatever needs to be like sealed up. So yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. So special clauses, contingencies, we've talked about that. HOAs. So uh, this is another thing we're going to look for in our RMLS, uh, listing agent fools is are there is there an HOA you get some buyers that say Ben I'll never ever live in an HOA don't even show me a house that's in an HOA you show a house you write at the offer you look and you go oh my god I missed it's in a $20 a quarter HOA even though it's 20 bucks a quarter they just don't they've had a bad dealing with them occasionally get a buyer that says I love HOA everyone keeps their house up keeps it clean I'm right down the middle you know I don't know about them. I'm in one but um they're more of a pain to me than anything else. So, but knowing those and knowing what those fees are, so you can give those to the lender as well, because they're going to count that in their, in their uh, outgoing cash. So if you got 160, you know, a quarter HOA or 80 bucks a month HOA or something like that, they got to know that they got, they got to count for that just like they would any other kind of outgoing cash. Okay. Even though it's not in their payment. So knowing that, and then going over the CCNRs with them, that's always a delicate topic. The CCNRs are never skinnier than that. Um, 
and then a lot of houses that we show have CCNRs, but there's no HOA or it had an HOA, but it was never established now that HOA is gone. Those are case by case situations that you need to talk with your, with your buyers about and explain and be accurate in explaining that saying, Hey, look, there are CCNRs to this property. They were written in 1962, but no HOA was never set up. Okay. So there's no homeowners association to enforce these CCNRs. So, and there's no HOA dues. And from how I understand it, for an HOA to come back, you have to get 100% of all the properties and houses to agree to be part of that HOA. So when a buyer asks, well, can they come back with an HOA tomorrow? Only if you agree. That's how I understand it, okay? Don't see it very often, but you'll see a lot. There's CC, and people say, oh, there's CCNRs here, and I'll hear agents say, no, there's no CCNRs. There's just CCNRs in most, in most all houses. It's just, is there an HOA to enforce those, okay? Uh, possession date, that's a big one. Again, we're asking our sellers, asking that, or excuse me, asking the, um, counseling the buyer's agent, excuse me, we're on the seller side now. We're counseling that buyer's agent. Hopefully they called, hey, what, 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 are, your, what are the hot buttons for your sellers or, or are they, do they have another place to go? Okay, these are questions the buyer's agent should be asking you. If not, it's just something you need to make sure that you have uh, in place for your seller because when it comes down to moving, that's the most stressful part of a transaction, especially for sellers. Um, you know, when they see that, okay, we close on a Friday, I gotta be out of here by Sunday at five. You wanna make sure we're all on the same page going into this offer of when they need to give those keys up and how that works, okay? And explain to them if they put, you know, that's why we have two business days at 5 p.m. for possession. It used to be you'd write in the date, Saturday at 5 p.m. Well, what if the close date was Wednesday and then it turned into Thursday, you know? So that's why you have two business days after three business days on the day of closing. So now it's all about what day of closing and then how many business days or calendar days after that. And that's why we don't have days of the week anymore because people would get, you know, they have had Sunday at five for 45 days in their head. We gotta be out Sunday at five, Sunday at five. Well, it didn't record till a day later or day, it recorded a day earlier, those change. So again, um, having those possession dates um, for your client is, is important on both sides. Presenting the offer to our client, call in, know you have one. I always try to present in, pos uh, in person if possible. Um, never criticize the buyer, the agent, or the offer. Obviously that's, that's, you know, but when you have multiple offers, we do want to give it a fair shot. This is what's best for our client of ours. We can counsel them the best we can, or I do, but ultimately that decision is theirs. And we just want to have that professional be professional the way okay um explaining the offer discuss the days on market numbers are showing and review an updated cma that's right do a second cma even if it's a week or two out you don't have to do a full-on cma but print out the properties that are new to the market pending to the market or back on markets so i may bring two or three properties and say okay look we got an offer it's full price it's not over full price Usually that's the conversation. I really have under asking prices. Sometimes you do. If you do have an under asking price, you say, hey, look, we got two new comp two new properties that are in direct competition of us. This one's priced 15K lower than us. This one's pr priced 10K lower than us. Yeah, they came in 5,000 under, but here's, here's what our competition is moving forward if we don't come to terms right now. Okay. Um, this is where they look to you. A lot of times sellers say, Ben, what do you think? What do you, you know, a lot of sellers have equity in their house right now. So if they, if they bought their house three or four years ago, they're going to get like 120 grand cash. Difference between 120, 115 cash, a lot of times they'll just say, well, what do you think then? You know, I'm getting, a, I'm getting a lot of money out of this. So what do you think? Even if I know that buyer's not going to come up, I'll try to get them something. Again, while they're asking for the washer dryer, I see if I can bump them up a grand for you. Okay. Well, Ben, I'm planning on including those in the offer. I know, but I'm just trying to get you an extra thousand bucks. A thousand bucks, a thousand bucks. And maybe I won't even formally counter that. I may call the other agent. Hey, we're close here. You're 5,000 under. Would they come up a grand? We'll throw in the washer dryer and refrigerator. And most of the time people are gonna say, yeah. I mean, just something like that. You get them an extra thousand bucks, thousand bucks, a thousand bucks, but you went, you went, back, you went to bat for your client, even though they would have accepted that. Um, but again, you gotta have your numbers to prove that. Your TMO reports, those should be a religious thing. Every, every week you look at those TMO reports, okay? Especially for the, the areas um, that you're working in. So if you got buyers in Eugene, buyers in greater Eugene out in the country, you need to have those reports on hand. It'll help you when you write the offers and it'll help you when you present it to a seller. Okay, so again, going, it's just going back to knowing your numbers. So obviously the decisions accept, counter, or reject, okay? Reject is the last resort. And I guess if you only have one offer to reject one offer, I, I don't see why you would do that. Even if it's way, way under, um, totally unrealistic, at least try. Sometimes buyers just gotta go through a thing. They got it. I gotta try to offer 20K under. I just gotta try it. Even if they're ready to pay full price. You get a seller that's really upset, no, let's just reject it. It's kind of a full price. It's kind of a full price, explain to them. We've, I'll explain to the agent, we've only been on 10 days. We had three showings yesterday. Let's just try it. So rejecting an offer is the very last thing I would ever recommend anybody do. Um, unless of course you have multiple offers, you can only sell one house, okay? 
All right, so an hour and a half, geez. Okay, uh, presenting the offer. So scripts uh, on the top of page 22. We're not gonna go over that. I'm not gonna read this to you guys. Um, you guys can all read through these. Um, normally right now we break into groups and cart and start uh, you know, going over some of those scripts. I, I urge you guys to at least look over it. Um, you may get a couple things out of there. For me, scripts and dialogues work like this. I'll read them a couple times. There may be something that I'll add to my toolbox that's in there that I didn't add before, okay? You don't really literally have to go over paragraph by paragraph. I know Keller Williams is huge on scripts and dialogues, but it's all about, you know, we all have scripts. Every morning we wake up, the way we say good morning to people. I mean, but read through those and all the, those scripts are there for a reason. It's not a lot of uh, uh, fat in those scripts. It's pretty much, this is each one, each one of those sentences has a reason. So I'd look through those at least. Um, next session, it sounds like uh, you guys have negotiations. So they'll, they'll dive deeper into that. I know we talked a little bit about that. But you know, whether you're representing the buyer or the seller, the goal is the same. Um, you want a positive, efficient uh, transaction that ultimately leads to a win-win agreement. Okay. Uh, I think that is it. Action plan. Let's see here. Uh, find out what forms. Do you guys know what the forms you need? How, how many people have done a listing? Can you raise your hand? A listing. Okay, so there's forms that you were gonna need besides the RMLS input forms. There's forms in our office that we'll need. So like um, uh, permission to put an MLS, permission to put a lockbox, things like that. I would go ahead and ask your market center for those or I can send them to you even if, you, if you're getting a slow response. But start getting yourself familiar with those forms because you know I've heard a lot of great things. A lot of you guys are, you guys are doing your lead gen. You got a couple listings. I think Johnny said you got some that are coming up. Get familiar with those forms and have those in a packet so that, you know, if you get a buyer, a seller call, hey, you know what? I was talking with the wife last night. I'm ready. We're, let's do this. Come over today. Have all that stuff ready and get familiar with those forms. Listings, um, it's got a few extra forms, um, but it's not, it's not too bad. Your disclosure, same things. I would pair up you guys and do uh, a presentation of an offer and go through those disclosures. Yes, Jerry. Uh, so I had heard that you like to print out your offers and fill them out by hand, which is what I'm used to back, you know, 12 years ago. Uh, it was all paper and faxing. And so you're saying it's, it's okay to do that and we could somehow get it into the system uh, as an electronic doc at some point, but doing paper is okay? Absolutely. So all my offers, I print them out and, you know, I may fill in like my name and the realtor's name and type it in there, but I'll print those out. And then I'll, here's something else I'll do real quick, guys. I know, I know you guys are busy. I'm trying to get you guys out of here. Another thing I'll do is I'll have my offer print out. So I got 11 page offer printed out and I'll just take a highlighter and you know, they have all the numbers on the side that have the items, the lines. I'll go through highlight number 12, which is, um, you know, list price. I'll highlight uh, you know, earnest money and balance of down payment. And so I'll go through and I'll highlight these. So that's way when I'm sitting with a buyer, if I have some of the stuff pre-filled out, like my name and my license and the company I work with and I represent the buyer exclusively, the name, the license, the company that the other sellers with that represents the agency exclusively, I'll have maybe that stuff filled out, but I'll go through with them and I'll have those little check marks, little earmarks, a reminder, okay, this needs attention as I'm sitting with the buyer. Because you never want to assume what they're going to offer. So you go through there and you fill all that stuff out, but I do mind a big big pens and, and uh, big blue ink. And I, you right. know, I, I, I know when I worked in 05, you would get um, uh, the, the carbon <laughs> copy. Closers. Oh my gosh. Yeah, everything yeah. was on three pages, pink, yellow, and you oh. keep white, like, and, and you know, once I get this offer signed, whether it's in the kitchen or the house, I come back, yeah. I scan it in the, I scan it in our copier here, goes to my email, and then I could now, and now I have an electronic PDF. But um, that's something I do. Um, I just like writing it in, in, in ink. And, and it helps you get familiar and it's going to make you comfortable too as you're going through because sometimes if you're not super familiar with this contract and you freeze up a little bit it's a good stall point for you because every page is going to have a, a an action item so if you're going through and you kind of oh i forget what that FERPTA thing is well right after that it talks about possession and close so you can break up the conversation okay we talked about close of escrow in a buyer consult it's typically 30 35 days uh, the next 30 days out approximately for a friday would be this and it just kind of it'll slow you down it'll keep you keep that momentum going and uh, you're sitting there basically, I mean, how long does it take to make an offer? 10 minutes? It's really easy. It's super, super easy to do. So if you have most of that done and you're just going through and filling it out with the buyer, it's ensuring them too, they're not overwhelmed with this 10 page offer that they got to sign and really not read. You basically tell them this is boilerplated. All the areas we're filling out are basically our terms. Okay. Great, great question. Anybody else have any questions on things like uh, on stuff? 
Um, Gary Draper offered a, for a long time when I started at Remax, he did it. And I think he still does it here. You may want to uh, ask the market center, but he does um, an MLS offer presentation. So he basically has an offer that he goes through and how he presents it to his buyers. I took that class in 2005 and I still do my offer the same way. So I recommend taking that class from him or somebody that really knows the offer well, because you'll probably use a lot of that same stuff years from now um, and how to present and go through that offer. So um, I always thought we should do that in this class. And they said, no, that's not the class for it. So um, yeah, Margarita, love to take the class. Let me, I'll, I'll ask Mar to, uh, to ask if Gary Draper's still doing that. And if he does, or even if he's not, he's a good guy. Maybe he'll, you know, if you get 10 of you guys together, maybe he'll do it. It's super, super informative. I'll pop in there once in a while, just to like at the, you know, January to come out some new terms. I'll kind of go in there and listen, be like, oh, that's what that paragraph is. You know, because if the client ever does ask, hey, what does that mean? What is, what is exactly is the FERPTA? What exactly is this stuff? You, you know, I don't know. I know, but not that well. You know, I could probably uh, learn a little bit more too on that. So, uh, but yeah, I'll find out on that. See if Gary do that for you guys. Okay. Keep your lead gen going, practice your scripts. Yeah, Danielle. Um, I'm sorry, I'm such a monopolizer. You're fine. Um, you said that there were some documents that you'd be willing to email out to us, um, some forms. I know you mentioned it a couple times. Um, can we get your contact info so we can email you directly? Are you typing it in the chat? There you go, guys. That's my email. If you email me that, um, I'll go ahead and put kind of like a sample checklist of when I get an offer um, accepted, what I sent to my buyers. It'll also keep you guys um, in check too, because um, another thing I do, I don't know if you can see that right there, my board. At any time, I can look up and say, oh, okay, what is my, um, we haven't wrote a repair denim, I haven't tell, oh, shoot, I have until tomorrow at six or tomorrow at five. So that's something too that I would recommend is getting a detailed board. And I got this from Larry. He probably got it from Galen. He probably got it from some realtor, you know, 20 years ago. But, um, you know, you get it. I'm a visual person. If I, if I go to work and I don't have this, I have to go home and get it or go and buy one from Office Depot. So I have a checklist. So for me, I, I heavily can write along. So, um, but this, that email that you sent out to your buyers, you can incorporate with your board and go, okay, this is the date I told them. Double check the dates. Perfect. Boom, boom, boom. And that way you never get jammed up on a repair den. Because that's the worst feeling. You wake up at, you know, 10 at night, 11 at night, and go, oh, it was today business day 10. The worst, the worst feeling. Because then you're about ready to write a check if you are, if the seller says, no, we're past our repairs. Okay, just keep in mind, when you pass that inspection date, you've accepted that house and as is uh, condition. Even if you present a repair to the seller and they're lagging getting back to you, okay? Yes. Uh, so uh, back when I was doing it, it um, you had to actively remove contingencies. They didn't just automatically slip off into the abyss. Yep. Is what are you saying? Are you saying that they do now? Yeah. So so I'll, I'll use our. Out? Yep. Oh, so I remember doing the re removal of contingencies. You do three or four of them throughout the transaction. Remove the. Oh yeah. You know the the inspection. Remove the lead based paint. Remove the cell disclosures. Removal of contingencies have kind of gone by the wayside. I still use them for buyers. Most buyers don't use them a lot. Um, and I wow. use it at the end of the transaction just to kind of give the last, hey, we're legally covered, everything's done. But for an inspection, um, Jerry, if we made an offer today, our first business day, uh, we get an accepted offer right now, our first business day starts tomorrow, okay? Right. So 10 business days starting tomorrow, one, two, four, you know, through the weekend, five, six, seven, eight, nine, through the weekend, 10, 11, you know, let's say it's a Tuesday, okay, uh, two weeks from now. If you made a repair addendum, even tomorrow on business day nine, Okay, you have nine business days left. You made a repair done tomorrow, but that seller never responded to you. And you go to Tuesday at five, two weeks from now, 10 business days from now. If you don't catch that and that seller didn't respond, your buyers accepted that house. The sellers don't have to do anything. That Your inspection contingency is gone. Okay, good to know. Yeah, Thank you. that's one you got to watch. And as a realtor, I, I'm very conscious for that, for buyers. I, you know, I don't sit on those repair denims. But if yeah. you get an agent that's busy, they grew too fast, they're not leveraging, right? Yeah. We were talking about leverage a long time ago. Um, they could let those slip, and it's, it's not intentional. And most of the time, a seller will make good. Oh, yes, you did submit that five days ago. But if the seller's a lawyer or something like that, you know, right. looking for a way out maybe, hey, yeah. sorry, you let it lapse. Even though you asked me and I was the last one to have the ball in my hand, you, you, it's it's a bad situation to be in, especially if there's some bigger pairs in there. Okay, because even if the sell buyer loses it, and you back out, um, which you got to find another contingency for now, right? Even if they back out, they're probably in an inspection and a contingency. So yeah, watch those contingencies, especially the inspection ones. Absolutely, thank you. Good question. 
Good question. Yeah, so send me an email. I'll send you the sample. Um, what I do for when I get into escrow with buyers and sellers, kind of the next steps, my next uh, things. And then I'll also send you just the disclosures for listings. I'm sure you guys have those. I know a lot of you do. I know you can get it from the office, but I'll put what I do with all my listings in addition to the MLS form. Um, and then you have, if someone have the buyer's uh, disclosures, do I want to send those too? If you want the buyer disclosures, yeah, I'll just send them both. Okay, I got, I'll respond to everyone's uh, email with the buyer, uh, buyer side, seller side. Okay, it's not bad. We're supposed to be another hour and a half, but you guys go out and lead Jen or have a beer or something. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you guys. Thank Keep you. up the good work. Keep up the lead Jen and you guys can always reach, um, come to my office or shoot me an email or give me a call anytime, okay? Thank you so much. Appreciate you great. Guys. All right, great. take care. And you Bye. said you were going to include a checklist? The buyer's yeah, so checklist. I'll, I'm gonna send you uh, within the email. Um, so, so when I when I have a, a buyer sell, I put to do checklist. Yes, and then so I'm right. going to send that to you, uh, basically okay. what I do in there. And then you can always reference page 13, and I think it's page 20, the checklists. And, yeah, checklist for preparing an offer, and then checklist for making an offer, or writing an offer is on page 15. So look at 13 or 15, use that conjunction with the email. The email is just to describe out and lay out in front of the buyer and the seller. Here's where our next timelines are. Here's our next calendar days to check off as we go. But yeah, okay, I'll just perfect. include all that stuff. You guys take what you need. Thank you. With basically what you fill your chart in with your driver. My board? Yeah, yeah, I'll send a picture of the board. I'll put that in there. Awesome. Yay. Yeah, and if you have anything else, just hit me up anytime. Yeah, I was Thank hoping, you. I almost asked you, can you show us the board again? <laughs> no, I'll write down everything that I have in there. I'll take it, I'll just take a picture awesome. of it. Yeah. Awesome. You can you. send this awesome. email as well to Mara, and then Mara can distribute it to the rest of us. Maybe I'll do that. I'll just send it to Mara, and then I, I'll, if you guys don't want it, you can disregard it, but I'll, I'll, um, I'll email Mara by tomorrow with all this stuff and ask awesome. her. I'll say that you guys all wanted a copy of it. Perfect. Great. Sound Thank good? You. Yeah. Thank you. All right, guys. Thanks again. Bye. Thank you. Bye.